pensioner has been left penniless after her local council persecuted her for saving too much of her pension. Mary Morley, who has learning difficulties, saved a little bit of her state pension every week after retiring age 65 in 1998. The former chambermaid, who received just a mere £149.54 a week, did not want to burden her family. What has this got to do with you, crypto goers? A lot more than you realise. G'day crypto goers, I'm Adam Stokes and welcome to an interesting story tonight about an 86 year old pensioner who had her money taken away from her for saving it. In recent videos I've spoken to you about the pending negative interest rates and the impact of that on all of us and what it actually means. Before I go on with this article I want to touch on the consequences of negative interest rates for all of us. So first of all, why do governments put in negative interest rates? Essentially, to stimulate the economy. The point of negative interest rates in theory in pure economic terms is to make people spend their money. So it'll affect you in two ways. And this isn't just for Australia or England or America. This is pretty much for anyone in the first world. And arguably, as it creeps into second and third worlds, it's going to be a huge global impact. So if you've got money in the bank, and at the moment you're earning some type of interest rate on it, the more that they lower interest rates, the less money you'll get paid, as in the less interest you will get paid on that money you save. And once we go into negative interest rates, you'll actually start to pay the bank money to save your money. That is, you will pay the bank for the privilege of putting your money into their accounts. So why would they do this? Well, essentially, on a macroeconomic scale, it is done so you spend your money. It makes you take your money out of the account and put it into the economy to stimulate an economy by buying crap, pushing money into the economy and keeping it moving. On the other end, that is when it comes to borrowing money, they want people to get into debt. Debt drives banking. Without debt, they don't actually make any money, especially with fractional reserve lending. Remember, with fractional reserve lending, you say, I want to borrow $100,000. They only actually have $5,000 in the bank and they make the additional $95,000 out of thin air, and then you're paying back real money for imaginary money, and the economy, in theory, wins because now the economy is stimulated because you are buying a house, going on a holiday, buying a car, arguably creating jobs by pushing money out into the economy and making things happen. But of course, all this does is drives up massive debt for everyone and discourages people to save. When I was a boy, I can remember in Australia, interest rates were about, I think, 17%. I was quite young, but I remember there was outrage in Australia when interest rates went up to, as in home loans, went up to 17%. Now, that sounds outrageous, but the reality is a house was around 30 grand. The average house was around 30 grand. Now, if we convert that to real amounts, as in you have nominal amounts and real amounts, back when I was a boy, if you put away all of your annual income, so if my parents just one of my parents had put away all of their annual income within one year they could have bought a house so although the interest rate was 17 percent you could in theory have a couple living and working together you would live off one partner's money and the other partner would save 100 percent of their money and mathematically you could in fact save enough for a house not just a deposit an entire house in one year off one wage and survive off the other wage Concurrently, you could also save money in a bank account and be earning around 5 to 10% in just an everyday saver account. So the interest rates were really high. And on one hand, we're saying, well, that's a huge interest rate at 17%. But it was only one year's income on average to buy an average house. And concurrently, if you weren't buying a house and you just wanted to save your money, you were actually encouraged to do that because you got paid big money for saving your money. You were being paid much more than inflation. And as a result, people were being encouraged to save. Fast forward a few decades where we are today, and we're now in a situation where governments are now penalising people for saving money. It is absolutely absurd, 
and we can now see that not only are your personal savings being stripped but also your superannuation and that was part of the Banking Royal Commission where they were finding that people who were saving a lot of their money they weren't getting the returns that they were promised and the money wasn't being invested properly and the whole banking sector wasn't doing the right thing with money. Also compare it to the global financial crisis that we saw not too long ago People who had been saving in super funds and investments and mutual funds over their entire life, just in time to retire for the GFC when all the money that they had put aside had crashed. We are now entering a new phase, particularly in Australia. This has been done in other countries and other economies where negative interest rates have been introduced. From the top of my head, Switzerland at 0.75% negative interest rates, where they are forcing people to spend their savings because if you don't spend your savings, it's going to chip away. It's going to disappear. You're going to be stripped of 0.75% every year. And that's not even including inflation. So if you put inflation on top of that, your money is literally eroding. On the other hand, they're actually saying, hey, get all this debt so we can push money into the economy. And then in a few years time, when the interest rates go back up, you are screwed. And in this article that I opened up with today about a pensioner who has saved her money, it appears that the government, a local government, a council, has taken that money off her. So before I go into two more quick articles I've got relating to this introduction, I want to explore this article a bit further, where the pensioner who was left penniless is in a real state of disarray, and this is an eye-opener to all of us, especially the elderly people in the community right now, where they may have been doing the right thing by trying to save, only to have a council, not even a state or federal government, but just a council, come into their bank accounts and take their money. And this will all lead to the culmination of this episode that I'm doing tonight about where will you put your money, noting I don't give financial advice on this channel. The article reads on, but she fell victim to a scandal which sees elderly people on low incomes stripped of their nest eggs by councils fed information from the Department of Work and Pensions, DWP, Mrs. Morley, who does not drink, smoke, or own a television, has lived alone since her husband, Cedric, died in 2001. By tucking some of her weekly pension money away, the frail pensioner from Stibbington, near Peterborough, unwittingly saved more than the £16,000 allowed by people claiming housing benefit. And last year, officials from Huntingdonshire District Council began the brutal process of taking it back. Since then, Mrs Morley, who has carers twice a day, has been dragged through the courts. Last night, her son David, 60, said, My mum has skimped and saved all her life. She was plunged into depression overnight and has lost the independence that she has guarded so fiercely until now. The process by which this is done is unbelievably callous. People in their 80s and 90s, probably alone with health problems, are targeted. It's happening to these people because, in spite of their tiny pension, they have managed to save a little after a week. But by doing so, they have crossed the savings limit for claiming housing benefit and council tax support, most likely without even realising. I'll leave a link to this article and when I first heard it I was a little bit suspicious because we know that there are people who do exploit the system. We know that there are people who are earning a lot of money and they don't declare it and they rip off the good taxpayers and the government by saying I've got no money, give me free stuff and the government does the right thing and helps them out only to find later on that they've been ripping off the system so they incur a debt. This is in fact not the case. The case with the information I have related to this article is that Mrs. Morley had earned her pension, legally obtained housing support after her husband died, and of the money that she was paid, she didn't blow it on cigarettes or alcohol or gambling. She just put a little bit aside. Now, what this actually tells us is that the government wants people to remain poor by blowing their money. And this leads on to the introduction to this episode. Savings are now being discouraged. And in this example, a pensioner who has saved too much has that money taken off her. And what's going to happen when people who read this article will likely say, well, I better spend this money because if I don't spend it, I'll get in trouble and the government will take it off me. We're now in a very interesting and difficult time where governments are encouraging people to blow their money instead of saving it. Now, if she doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink. What is she going to put her money on? Well, she's got to buy clothes or gamble or going out to dinner. On one hand, on the macro scale, that stimulates an economy. On the other hand, though, it doesn't promote a good set of fiscal values of being frugal with your money and doing the right thing with your money. It's in fact saying, push your money out into the economy, don't save it, blow it, 
otherwise will come and take it off you. Now combined with negative interest rates, we are now in a very interesting place in the world where governments are saying, if you don't spend your money, if you don't go into debt, we will ensure that you are in a worse situation than trying to do the right thing. That being saving your money and not going into debt. Negative interest rates will push people into the crypto world, bringing this down under. Now remember, this is not just applicable to the United Kingdom or the Commonwealth of Australia. This is in fact applicable to the entire global economy. This flow on effect of negative interest rates in the global marketplace and the global economy will affect all of us and I would argue drive Bitcoin through the roof as people flee out of this absurdity to put their money somewhere where the government cannot get their greedy fingers on it and make you do what you don't want to do with your cash. This article from Ainsley Bullion reads, Bank bail-ins in Australia, why your cash isn't safe. Is your money really safe in a bank? One of the key outcomes of the G20 summit held in Brisbane in 2014 was the agreement amongst those nations around the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, financial stability broad bail-in provisions. A bail-in creates a write-off or conversion into shares if a failing bank of what that bank owes to unsecured creditors instead of the government bailing the bank out, as was the case during the GFC. As a bank depositor, you are an unsecured creditor of that bank. So to be clear, this means that the bank can write off, as in take your deposit or a percentage of it, to use your deposit to buy shares in their failing businesses, which you would then own part of. Congratulations. So I'll leave a link to this article and I won't read the whole thing and I do encourage you to read it. But this is basically saying, as I outlined in a previous episode, a law was passed in the early hours of a Senate sitting in 2018, the 14th of February 2018, where there were only eight who were present at least, passed through this financial sector legislation amendment. This bill that said governments are now allowing banks to create bail-in laws. A bail-out law is where the government bails out the bank who's done the wrong thing with their money or your money or someone's money. But now the government has pushed this back onto you and I by saying, no, there are now bail-in laws. So if the bank blows your money, they can take more of your money off you to fix their situation. So think about where we now sit in Australia and in other countries, because remember, this was part of the G20 summit. The Bank for International Settlements, Financial Stability, Broad Bail-in Provisions spoke to all the G20 nations to say, hey, let's put in this law that when banks blow everything and make really bad investments, we can simply go to people and take their money off them. This is law. This isn't a theory. This is how it is. So you save all your life, you do the right thing, and then the banks blow the money, take high risks. And, and why wouldn't you take a high risk? Imagine you're running any business. You can imagine any business in the world and you take super high risks to get super high returns. And if it all goes pear shape, you just go to all your customers and say, well, we, we made a big mistake, pay us for it. Why wouldn't you take super high risks? Why would you take low risk? Because if you take low risk, you only get a low return. But if you take a high risk, you now get a high return. And if you don't get any return, well, you just take all the money off your customers. This is the world you now live in. You now live in a world where the government can either take your money through your taxes of a bailout, or they can direct the bank to take your money from your account in a bail-in. You must read this article, my crypto brothers and sisters. If you're not alarmed, you're missing something crucial in this situation. This is not a theory. This is not a possibility. This is law. This is legislation. This bill was passed into legislation in Australia and is now what you face. You face a law of bailouts using your tax dollars or bail-ins using your savings. And you are completely powerless to do anything about it. Combined with negative interest rates, where are you going to put your money? If you leave it in the bank, you're going to lose money through both inflation and the bank charging you fees for it. If you leave it in the bank and you deal with that negative interest rates and something goes wrong, you're then going to lose it through a bail-in. So if you pull your money out of the bank and you say, well, I'll just put it under my mattress, well, now you're dealing with inflation and the possibility of theft. So where do you put your money? 
well, traditionally might put it in stocks, but I've been investing in stocks since first year university. And I can tell you after doing it for more than two decades, even in high, low, medium risk stocks, typically the best you could hope for, the best you could hope for in a year is 12%. And that's a pretty good year. But typically you're aiming for about 5 or 6%. And that's before inflation. Take inflation, you shave that off, you're down to 3 or 4% and you're still dealing with all the risk. Then you go over to gold. Well, guess what? If you've put your money in gold, which is something I've been doing since I was a little boy. In fact, I don't know why I even got into it. I just thought it was cool that I could buy little chips, little nuggets of gold. My dad showed me how it was done. So I'd save up little bits of money and get little bits of gold. And over years and years of storing this gold and dealing with the risk of having this gold, that has grown virtually nothing. Throwing the inflation around it and the risk associated with it, I've made virtually nothing off gold. And the rumours out there that there are huge reserves of gold and as people move out of gold into crypto, gold, in fact, is not only not growing much, but could, in reality, start to slip down in price. So where do you put your money? Well, you might say, I'll put it in real estate. Well, what's the point of putting it in real estate when yields are low, capital growth is almost nothing, and even if capital growth looks good on nominal numbers, it's not going up in real numbers. Real estate is a huge risk. Listen to the guy who's got a very wide real estate portfolio in different parts of Australia. I could buy more property and I'm certainly not going to. It's just not worth it. It is not worth it. So where do you put your money? Well, you know where I'd put it. I don't give you financial advice, but where else would you put it other than crypto? I close off with this article, my crypto brothers and sisters. Killer combo. How negative interest rates and cashless economies could propel Bitcoin adoption. History is the best of teachers. If you want to learn something about Bitcoin's future, it might be instructive to study our economic past especially interest rates. It may not be the most exciting topic, but it's easy to understand the importance of loan interest. We live in a debt-focused society that depends on borrowing in order to function. Readers of a certain age might recall the economic devastation caused by the usurious interest rates on everything from car loans to mortgages back in the 1980s. It was not unusual for someone to walk into the bank, drop their keys on the counter and leave their homes behind along with debts. Many homeowners did precisely that, causing the home prices to plummet rapidly with nobody left to borrow from the banks at such high interest rates. The entire economy slowed to a crawl. A quote from Paul Solomon, PBS NewsHour correspondent, says, Inflation was running rampant, usually thought to be the result of the oil crisis of that era, government overspending and the self-fulfilling prophecy of higher prices leading to higher wages leading to higher prices. The Fed was resolved to stop inflation. So Chairman Paul Volcker kept raising rates in 1980 and 81, eventually bringing the economy and inflation to a standstill. So that was what I was talking about earlier in this episode. Interest rates were so high, and although that put a lot of pressure, huge pressure, on people who could not afford to pay back loans that they had got at single-digit interest rates, and when they went up to double digits, and when they went up to double-digit interest rates, they simply couldn't afford to pay it anymore, so they just handed over their property. And when no one could afford to get any more loans, everything came to a standstill, including inflation. So that's where they adopted inflation as part of economic growth. So-called controlled inflation, money going down in value, was a good thing because it ensured that interest rates, in theory, could remain low. People would borrow, which is what we are dependent on in economies. You borrow money to create money out of thin air through fractional reserve lending that creates jobs through people buying houses buying cars going on holidays getting into debt but of course there are consequences for always getting into debt and for always having inflation the article goes on to say in response to the severe economic stall the federal reserve reversed course interest rates were peeled back stimulating the economy and encouraging consumers to borrow and spend housing prices climbed upward in response to the willingness of buyers to once again take on debt and part with their money, now that it was safer to do so. Moving on. So low interest rates are the way to go then, right? Why would we ever want to see higher interest rates if they just slow down the economy? It's really a simple problem. The lower interest rates are, the more people are willing to borrow. The more people are willing to spend from their borrowed funds, the higher the market price of everything from food to cars to real estate will climb. Essentially, low interest rates contribute directly to inflation. And that means the more money we push into economy, the more prices go up. Because if more people have more money, 
you have to, as a seller, start putting up the price of whatever you're selling. So the money that you're getting, which is now worth less due to inflation and dilution, you have to put prices up. So this direct correlation of putting interest rates down, increasing inflation also increases prices, both nominal and real. The trouble is the exact whereabouts of this Goldilocks zone are imprecise. And as the world's consumers continue to accrue more debt, it edges closer and closer to zero and in some cases goes to negative. A few European countries have already established negative interest rates. Sweden, Switzerland and Denmark are good examples and the International Monetary Fund has recently proposed a mechanism that would make deeply negative interest rates a feasible option. When interest rates are negative, you get to pay for the privilege of storing your money in the bank. That doesn't just mean bank fees, but also interest charged on the money you hold in your account. Your savings gradually dwindle as you are forced to pay to save your money. For the average person, the only alternative is to borrow money and spend it. After all, it is cheap to borrow. What's the point of saving it? So not only do you not save your money, you go out and you borrow money because it's cheaper to borrow money than to save it. This is mind boggling stuff, but it is where we are heading. And everything on the planet that can be bought gets more expensive because everyone would rather spend money than save it. So prices start to go out of control and the wealth gap grows because those who can't borrow money, because remember, not everyone can borrow money. So those who can't borrow money, all they see is everything from a loaf of bread to a holiday to a car to a house to rent everything getting ridiculously expensive it creates a wealth gap as the rich who can afford to borrow money get arguably richer but they're doing so getting in more debt and the middle class get into even more debt but the lower class are left out of the economy entirely as they can't afford to pay for anything they can't afford to keep up going cashless if you're feeling bold, you might be tempted to take cash out of the bank, stuff it into a safe and protect your wealth that way. There are a couple of problems with this. First, your cash is gradually diminishing in value as it sits there, as everything around you grows more expensive. Secondly, the countries with negative interest rates are also halting the printing of paper cash, altogether going completely digital. You can't store digital money in a safe, or anywhere for that matter, except in your bank account. You know, the one where your money continuously dwindles to negative interest rates. This is the killer combo. Negative interest rates and cashless economies. So in Australia, we are going more and more cashless. Tap and pay. Government shop fronts refusing to take their own legal tender. I think it's absolutely absurd. The government puts out money called the Australian dollar. Then they'll give you a bill, which is fine. And then you go to take that Australian money to a government shop front. And they're like, no, we don't take that money. We only take digital money. So you can't even save your cash because there's physically not enough cash for everyone. And we know this. If everyone went to the bank and went to take their money out of the bank, there wouldn't be enough. There's not enough physical cash. So this argument with crypto that, oh, I'm not ready for digital. We are already digital. We are already in a society that uses digital cash. The difference between crypto and fiat is that fiat is unlimited, whereas crypto has a finite amount. Crypto relies on the backing of mathematics, whilst fiat relies on the backing of what the government says and fractional reserve lending and unlimited amounts and olden day thinking and inflation and the list just goes on. Switzerland, Denmark and Sweden, which have negative interest rates, are also among those leading the way towards a cashless society. In these economies, you can't save your money in a bank because it's gradually confiscated by the bank. Yet you can't withdraw your funds as cash because there is no such thing as cash. Inflation is inevitable and can only accelerate in this scenario, especially when combined with the quantitative easing that countries use to print ever greater amounts of money. This continuous addition of more money further dilutes the value of every single dollar bill. The wealthiest among us already know how to avoid this problem. Accumulation of assets. Real estate, gold, silver and for the past decade, cryptocurrency. Now I've already gone into real estate and precious metals. And of course, now we have a new option, cryptocurrencies. 
I'm not interested in real estate because of fractional reserve lending. On a moral side, I don't like this idea of diluting everyone's money by borrowing a million dollars. That isn't even real money. The bank only has a few thousand of that million dollars and the rest of the money is created out of thin air. Therefore, I dilute everyone's money, including my own, through inflation and the creation of money that was never there. I also don't want to take on the risk of the real estate market. I don't want to pay the continually raising rates and land taxes and landlord insurance and it just goes on and on and on. And if you buy an apartment, you're paying increased strata fees. The amount of money that you have to pump out to all of these other organizations simply just to hold a property whilst the yields are going down, as in both the nominal and real amount of rental yields you are making, why would I get into real estate? Gold is not fungible. It's heavy. I have to store it. It's not going up in value that much. So all I'm left with is cryptocurrency. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are the perfect antidotes to this killer combo. Being easy to acquire and exchange, these digital assets offer a nearly frictionless escape from both negative interest rates and the resulting inflation. Cryptocurrencies also enjoy the added value of being highly portable compared to just about any other asset, but especially market-resistant assets like real estate and gold. While the current cryptocurrency market is fraught with volatility and uncertainty, it is growing steadily. As legacy money continues to dwindle in value and savings are slowly picked away by central banks, cryptocurrencies can serve as a sort of protection of value. Like all other assets, Bitcoin could see long-term growth in value as a shelter from the storm of negative interest rates. So I close with this. Where else can you put your money? You, my crypto brothers and sisters, have already realized this. What will happen in the next few months and years as governments start to drop interest rates even lower and inflation spirals out of control, more and more people will enter this space, more and more people will put money into crypto, and because there's only a finite supply, price will inevitably go up. Bitcoin waits for no one. It does not discriminate. It can't be controlled. And this is why Satoshi Nakamoto had to go anonymous. If he, she or they could be put on a stand like Facebook, it could arguably die. On one hand, we see the collapse of economies. On the other, we see the creation of a new one. The collapse of fiat economies will be replaced with the rise of cryptographic economies. This isn't if or maybe, but most certainly when and how quickly. Make sure you are in the right economy when this shift takes place. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Bye bye Fiat. And I'll talk to you next time.